So thankful to see you tonight. Uh, you decided to come back and worship God some more. Uh, and thank you, thankful for all of you individually. Uh, being a member here at Gardendale, and I, I truly consider myself blessed uh, to be part of this group, and I hopefully you do too and have the same feelings about this group that I do. Uh, so thank you for being here, and it's good to see your face. And uh, those really hopeful and loving sentiments that we have towards each other and towards our group, hopefully I'll, I'll end this sermon on those same thoughts, and you'll see me get there eventually. Uh, but before we get to those, some of those you know, wonderful thoughts we like to meditate on about our God and about his church or his local churches too, uh, we're going to have first a pretty <laughs> bleak title here. It's Living in a Sinful Nation. And this is what I want to go at tonight, and I think we'll be able to understand uh, a better concept of what God views about our nation and our church and his church as a whole. Uh, what I got thinking about this, and thinking especially this would be a good Sunday night sermon, is the signs, the other church signs you'll see driving around Gardendale or driving around Birmingham in general. Uh, often, if you look at these signs, yeah, which I do, they'll constantly use Old Testament verses to talk about the state of our nation. Uh, and you'll see, and we'll give some examples in just a second, but talk about how we need to somehow get the United States of America to repent and get back to a more righteous viewing point uh, for their lives and for God. And the sentiment of just getting people righteous and getting people right with God, I'm all for. And, and no way am I going to try to go against that a sermon. If someone's main goal in life is, I just want others to come to Jesus, why would anyone complain about that? I'm never going to complain about that. What I am more concerned about is when we use Old Testament passages out of context to try to describe our personal local nation and try to use passages, this, passages that were clearly not talking about the United States of America. And that's when I think it becomes very problematic, and you have people that have a very limited understanding of God and his word, and they're trying to apply things where things don't apply. And when we live in that world where we try to apply things where things don't apply in the Bible, we live in confusion, we come, become anxious, because we feel like that there's goals that we cannot meet. And we'll read several tonight, I'll give you some examples of you have Old Testament passages when he's telling the whole nation of Israel, you need to repent. Like, if you don't repent right now, you are going to die. I'm going to destroy you, right? And so you have a lot of people that might read those passages and get confused, misapply them, and think, I've got to get this whole country to repent or we're all going to die. And then we live in anxiety, and we start missing the goals that God wants New Testament Christians to focus on, and we start focusing on something else. So hopefully if you don't understand my explanation, you will understand as we go through this sermon what my goals are. And again, I'd like to finish talking more about God's church and God's priorities that he has for New Testament Christians. Why do you think there's so many signs out right now trying to get America to repent? And so much of a religious focus now of we've got to get back to where we were or we have to start using righteousness or God's going to kind of destroy us. I feel like in my life, at least, I've even seen an increase in street preachers, you know, saying that basically we're all going to explode or we're going to die, we're going to be destroyed if we don't repent soon. I see a lot of this more, and maybe someone can enlighten me better that, that's been around longer and has more experience with this. I have a small opinion, and I think that small opinion might be that in the past 20 years, politically, our emotions towards the White House have drastically changed, especially with the emotions and attitudes of mainstream denominations have changed on the way they view the political world. And let me give you a very brief example. If you look at all the religious affiliations of the presidents, it has drastically changed the past 20 years. So if you have most of the presidents before Lincoln, and if you want to talk about this after, I'd love to talk to you more about it, but I'm not going to spend sermon time talking about it, but it's interesting. If you look at a lot of the denomination affiliations before Lincoln, there's not much. And much of the presidents didn't really like talking about their religion, with the exception of Washington. But then after Lincoln, people start getting a lot more vocal as they run for president about what they believe in, what denomination they're a part of, what church they belong to. They get a lot more vocal about it. It almost capitalizes with guess who? George W. Bush. There was a PBS documentary recently about him and his presidency. They said that he was the most vocal about his religious background than any president we've ever had. And if you remember when President Bush was president, he did talk a lot about God. 
And he was very public about his faith and about his religious views. And, and he was very much a denominational man. You know, he was part of his denomination. He was very loyal to his denomination. After President Bush, the past two presidents, and of course I don't mean any disrespect. I think this is just a fact of something I can see. But definitely we look at President Obama, President Trump. Do you compare these men to be religious men? Usually we wouldn't say that President Obama or President Trump were very public about their religious beliefs or about their faith. Now that's a drastic change for what life was under President Bush, right? He would be all very vocal about his religious beliefs. And then we have two presidents that aren't very vocal about their religious beliefs at all. And I think what that has done is that has scared denominations. And I think that maybe some of our mainstream denominations have felt like they've had so much control over the government and over the political world they're realizing the past couple of years they don't have the control that they once did. So what are they doing? They're trying to tell people, you better get the United States to repent or God's going to destroy you. And I'm scared that as members of the church, we've gotten caught up into that, and we've gotten caught up into that chariot, and we ride in that chariot in the wrong direction. And we've forgotten about the things that Jesus told us to care about from the very beginning. And instead, we're so caring about the nation anymore, we're not caring anything more about the church. And his priorities there. And that's what my fear is. And let's talk about this uh, in more of a biblical way and let's read some passages. Number one, do all Old Testament passages about Israel apply to our nation? With no clarification, no context. No, not all Old Testament passages are apl- apl- applicable to the United States of America. Let me give you some examples. You'll see this one a lot. Same Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Ronald Reagan, when he swore into presidency, he had the passage open to this part in the Bible when he swore in. So did Vice President Pence. They both swore on and then on this passage. This is a passage you'll see a lot on a lot of church signs. Is this concept of, hey, if my people will repent, they will humble themselves, then I will forgive them of their sin and I will heal their land. If I just cut off the heal their land part, is this true for individuals? You know, absolutely, right? You know, this is what God wants. This is a common theme throughout the Bible. If you humble yourselves and repent, I will work with you, right? But this has a connotation for the whole country. Who was this originally said to? This was originally said to Solomon when he dedicated the temple. That, hey, if you get guys get on track, I will... Forgive you of your sin, and I will heal your land. Here's another one said in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Some versions there say thoughts of prospering, to give you a future and a hope. This is a passage said to Israel about what's going to happen after 70 years out of captivity. That God's like, I'm going to bring you back here. You're going to prosper. You're going to have a future. I'm going to get you back on track. We see that promise fulfilled through Nehemiah and Ezra and their work as they bring the people back out of captivity. Why do you think both of these verses are so popular? Both of these verses have a prosperity message. Concept of, I'm going to heal your land. And does God heal their land? Absolutely he does. They end up being at their wealthiest moment ever under King Solomon. It says that when Solomon was king after this moment, that gold were like the bricks on the street. And we see a brick on the street, and we kick it out of our way. And the metaphor here, that's how the Israelites felt about gold. Because God richly material blessed them under the promises he gave to them in St. Chronicles 7. What about Jeremiah 29, 11? They weren't living like Solomon, but they did come back. And they were able to rebuild the temple, and they were able to rebuild their walls, and they were able to become this powerful city as we carry into the life of Jesus, the city of Jerusalem, right? So these were promises made to these people for material wealth. And I think solely because we see the prosperity here, this is why it's become such a popular verse. And the thought is, well, if we're obedient to God, we will receive great wealth. And I think that's part of the motivation for seeing these. Of course, when Jeremiah 29, 11 is said, no one likes to do verse 10 because it puts it into context, right? Jeremiah 29, 10, before that, it says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Nobody wants to talk about the 70 years in Babylon. 
But that was what it was going to be for them, right? They're going to have to go to captivity for 70 years. We'll see this also in Deuteronomy 28. If you go ahead and turn there. Deuteronomy 28, when God is setting the foundation for the law, he lets the Israelites know, look, if you obey me, I will take care of you, not just spiritually, but as a nation. I will take care of your economy. I will take care of your food. I will take care of your farms as long as you obey me. These promises are not promises that are carried over in the New Testament for anybody and everybody. Look at verse 1 of chapter 28. It says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Right? I'm going to set you on the top as long as you obey me. This is another verse I've seen on a church sign. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come to you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And then he goes on to the blessings. Blessing shall be your city and blessed shall be your country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce from your ground, the increase of your herd, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be the basket of your kneading bowl. goes on and on about these material blessings. You keep on looking into verse 11. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock on the produce of your ground and the land which your Lord swore to your fathers to give you. And the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give you rain on your land in its season. And bless all your work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You are going to live good simply because you obey me. Now as well for God here with the deal he makes with Israel, it also works opposite. If you disobey me, I'm going to push you through a lot. And I'm going to curse you as a nation. Look at verse 15. But if it not come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall be you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be the basket in your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Right? And he gives off all the things that they live as a culture, as a community, as an economy, as a country. I'm going to curse you because you disobeyed me. And as we see throughout the Old Testament, this gets played out. That God works with them not as a church, not as individual people, but as a nation. Right? If you as a nation are doing good, I'm going to financially bless you. I'm going to bless you in other ways too. But here mainly, I'm going to take care of your financial needs. And if you disobey me... Well, then I'm going to curse you, and you're going to be miserable, and I'm usually going to let another country come in and take over because of the way that you've been acting. We see this filled out in Jeremiah 9-11. Uh, this is a verse that doesn't like to get me quoted out of Jeremiah. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. This is a fulfillment of the contract that they made in Deuteronomy. You disobey me, I'm going to make Jerusalem desolate like a den of jackals. It's going to be nothing because of the way that you've been living your life. Now, this is where the kicker comes in. In a New Testament age, all of these passages are not repeated. There is no promises for individual nations. There's one, perhaps, about a particular city, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But there are no financial blessing, materialistic promises, blessings, because this group of people is obeying the Lord. And so being that we understand that and we'll further prove this as we go on, it is very difficult to tell if God is purposely blessing or cursing a nation because of those nations' actions living today in the New Testament. It's very hard to do that, right? Is anyone going to say that the Lord is cursing the North Koreans because of the way they're living their life? And that's why they live under that dictatorship. Is anyone going to dare say that? Hopefully you don't. I would also say that, you know, I would come up here and say, well, the Lord is blessing those in Sweden. You know, we see all the stuff about their financial wealth and all the wonderful things that they have because they're obedient to God. No one really dares make that analogy either. I'll go even far. I've heard this, hope, thankfully not out of a Christian's mouth, but someone said that the African population was enslaved back in the early 15th, 16th century because they were disobedient to God in some way. I don't know if we can make those bold claims. Has God come and told you that? Because in the New Testament, we don't have anything to work with like that. Why is it that we can't make these bold statements about this nation's being blessed and this nation's being cursed in today's age? We can't because we don't have any prophets. 
we don't have a prophet to come and tell us that specifically, right? Now, as we get and start working about an individual basis, and I'm talking about Andrew Smith, I can be a little bit more, you know, liberal with my ideas of what God is going to tell me in that situation because I have this. And I can say, Andrew, you're miserable right now because you are living in sin, because I'm aware of that sin and I'm aware of my misery. Now, to be fair as well, though, sometimes we're going to be miserable and we're not living in any sin, right? Jesus has warned us that just because you see somebody wealthy, just because you see something healthy, doesn't mean that they're living righteously. Just because you see somebody poor, just because you see somebody sick, doesn't necessarily mean that they're living in sin. He tells us not to go there. Don't make those bold statements. Don't think about it like that. Because there's a lot more going on with God that we don't know. Now, can God still bless or curse a nation? Can he still do it today? Absolutely. He still has the power, doesn't he? He still rules in the nations of men. However, you're not going to hear me make a bold claim about what he's doing right now. Because I don't know God like that. And I don't see the things that he sees. And I certainly don't do the things that he does. Let's understand the dispensations. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, it says that God spoke first to the fathers through the prophets. Right? There's the prophets again. But now speaks to us through his son. The dispensations we see at the very beginning, there was a patriarchal law. That we have these tribes, we have these nations. And God spoke to these tribes and these nations, these families, through the patriarch. Whoever he communicated to for that family. We see that in Noah. We see that in Abraham. In Genesis 17, 26, you don't have to turn there. I'm not going to read it. But in Genesis 17, 26, Abraham circumcises not just himself, but also Ishmael, also Isaac, and all the people that were part of his group. All of his servants. All of his people. Why would Abraham circumcise everybody that was living with him? Because Abraham was the patriarch. He was the leader of that people, but he was also the spiritual leader of that people. We see this in a lot of different groups. We see Melchizedek as this. Melchizedek was the leader of his people, living during the same time, the same dispensation as Abraham. Melchizedek was also the spiritual leader of his people. To even give another one, and maybe I'm going too far, you can tell me later, but Pharaoh... When Pharaoh has Sarah, and he believes she's just Abraham's sister, there's a plague that goes against Pharaoh because he's taken Sarah in, in a, like a wife sense, when obviously Pharaoh wasn't allowed to have Sarah because she was already married to Abraham. But a plague comes, and for some reason, Pharaoh goes to Abraham and says, why did you do this to me? I know she's your wife because these things have fallen on me. It seems that even Pharaoh had inside knowledge about what God wanted in that situation. Perhaps even in Egypt, that they had that same situation where you would have a patriarchal law, and that's how God communicated to his his people. Then we have the big exception with the law of Moses. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and gives the Mosaic law, and that includes passages like Deuteronomy 28. Then, of course, what do we have next? And finally, we have the law of Christ, or the law of faith, right? And this is what we're living under right now. And this law was given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit, And they wrote it down so that we may too have their understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, like we see in Ephesians 3. And so this is what we're living under now. And so we're going to look to the law of Christ to find our priorities and our goals that Jesus wants us to have today. Not necessarily killing off the Old Testament, but only going there with an understanding that we are now under a different law, a law of the Christ. Before Jesus came to the earth, God did have a focus on repentance of individual nations. We see this all through the Old Testament. After I get done with this point, I think you're going to look up here and go, Andrew, you overkilled it. You didn't have to do this much. But there is so much information on God trying to get individual nations to repent before the life of Jesus. We see at the very beginning in Genesis 15. And if you want to look there, I found this passage, and I I talked to Andrew Beard about it last Sunday because he covered the life of Abraham. But it gives us some insight on 400 years later when Joshua is going to come in and wipe out all the Amorites in the land of Canaan. But even though it wasn't like Joshua just came in and stormed and started killing all these people, but actually God had been working with these nations in Canaan. They had fallen into sin, and now he's decided they need to be destroyed. And he uses the Israelites to accomplish that. Joshua's 15, excuse me, Genesis 15. If you look here, starting in verse 15, He's talking to Abraham. He says, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. 
For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's really interesting here. Abraham's living in Canaan. God tells him, hey, you're going to die here. That's going to be okay. But eventually, 400 years later, four generations later, your people are going to leave here, but then they're going to come back and they're going to destroy the Amorites. But they're not going to do it right now. They're not going to do it on your timetable because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What does that tell me about our God? It tells me that he even cared about the people like the Amorites. He even cared about those Gentiles living there. And that there was still needed to be a time for long suffering to allow these people adequate time to repent. Because God cared about the nations. He even cared about the Gentile nations. And he wanted them to repent and come to him. We see that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness in Genesis 19. Hopefully we're familiar with that story. We see in St. Chronicles 7.14, we've already read this, that he wanted the nation of Israel to repent and to get back on track with the Mosaic Law. God sent Jonah to get Nineveh to repent. Maybe this stands out the most to us, so let's read that one. Jonah chapter 3, if you go there. In Jonah 3, man, I hope I don't end up reading the whole chapter, but I might. Jonah is sent by God to get the Assyrian nation, the capital city Nineveh, to repent. And the people actually respond positively to it. In verse 1 of chapter 3 of Jonah, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on a sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way from violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, and he turned them from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God's divine care for this city, isn't it? That he desires these people to repent. He sends Jonah to go tell them to repent. Jonah tries to go a different way. He brings Jonah back and says, now tell them to repent. They repent. And eventually Jonah gets upset, right? Jonah wanted to see the fireworks. He wanted to see the city explode, you know, be destroyed in this grand way. And God's like, but what about all these people? Why, why would I not care about all these people, right? Because God did have this great care for these individual nations to repent. We see in 2 Kings 17 that the nation of Israel is put into captivity because they break the law that we see in Deuteronomy 28. We see that Nineveh even is eventually destroyed because of their wickedness in Nahum. God puts the nation of Judah in captivity. We started out reading about that in Jeremiah. As well, God takes Babylon away from King Belshazzar because of his wickedness. When Daniel tells them, hey, God's taking the throne away from you because of your wickedness, Daniel actually says the phrase there in verse 22, you knew all this. You already knew that this would happen, and yet you still made these poor decisions. So to be fair about this, and we look at the way things worked before Jesus, God did work with individual nations. He did declare their repentance and ask for it, demand it. So why was this? Why did God have this divine care for the nations like we see in the old law as we read it? Well, I got two reasons, maybe. Number one, God needed the nations to be in a certain place when Jesus came. And I think we see and we read about God working with the nations so often in the Old Testament because he had a plan. It involved Nineveh. It involved Babylon. He needed them all to be in the right place in the right order because he wanted everything to be perfect when Jesus came into the earth. And obviously, Jesus and God did a great job with this. They got all the nations exactly where they needed to be for the gospel to work and to spread. As well, here's my second reason. If you think about it, if you're trying to live as a righteous Gentile or a Jew in this time before Jesus, 
you didn't have a local church. You you didn't have a group of people that you met with, and these were your brethren, and these were the people that you were spiritually minded with, and then everybody outside those walls or outside that body where you're just your neighbors. That's not the way people lived, especially not the Israelites. We see that the Israelites, they considered everybody they lived with to be Israelites to be brethren. And that they all had this divine responsibility. Everybody that lived there in that nation were children of God and had an expectation that was supposed to be met. And so in a reality, sort of, if you're an Israelite living in Israel, that nation of Israel was sort of like your church. That was your spiritual body that you were part of. Now, of course, we can go and talk about faith and how important that is. And there were people that didn't have faith, and God said those weren't really Israelites. But we can say the same thing about Gardendale. You know, we're a group of Christians, but God could come here and say, well, you know, there's some of you, 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 you. You're not really Christians because I know the things that you do. I know you don't have faith, right? And so in a way, the nations were their church or the shadow of the church for them. So we see God working with these individual nations, but when we get into the New Testament, things change. And after this, God doesn't work with the individual nations like he did in the Old Testament. Or at least he doesn't reveal it to us the way he did in the Old Testament. God now has put a focus on the repentance of individual people or churches, local churches, and of course taking care of his church, capital C Church. Jesus is sent to seek and save the lost in Luke 19.10. Hopefully you know this passage. It says, The Son of Man had not come to seek and to save which has been lost. Lost. That was his mission statement. We read this, and we can read it again in Acts chapter 10. But Peter talking here explains that Jesus came to seek the lost regardless of what nation these people were a part of. Peter says this to Cornelius in Acts 10, 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel... Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That Peter says here, Jesus is looking to the lost in every nation. And he doesn't care what nation you're from. He wants you to be part of his body, his universal body of Christ. That's what he wants for you, right? I looked on nation search in the Bible. The word nation in the Old Testament is used like 300 times. It's insane. Because it's God going, if this nation doesn't repent, it's going to be destroyed. If this nation finally repents, I will bless them. But in the New Testament, the word nation is only used maybe 20 times. And mostly, when it's talking about the word nations, it's talking about this subject. That God accepts all nations, all people from all nations, to be part of his gospel and to be part of his church. God, of course, adds people, these people, to his church, right? And that's really the focus of the whole book of Acts. We see that in Acts 247. There's only one city I know of in the New Testament that God actually gives a warning of destruction to, and that's the city of Jerusalem. If you look at Luke 21, hopefully you're still around there. Luke 21, there was a prophet that came and prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. That prophet's name was Jesus Christ. And in his role as a prophet, obviously serving the role as king and priest, but in his role of a prophet, he does prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. It says here in Luke 21, 20, Jesus says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things that are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days. For they will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captives into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the three, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Right? As far as I know, this is the only time in the New Testament a physical city is promised destruction. And Jesus' message here isn't repent and, and get your city together. Jesus' message here is get out of town. When you see the armies are surrounded... Pack your bags and leave because it's going to be destroyed, right? As far as I know, this is the only one we've got like the ones we see in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. We see that God deals actually with every local church in the New Testament. 
He encourages them to press on or rebukes them to repentance. Let's look at an example in Revelation 3. In Revelation 3, him talking to the church at Sardis. We could almost use every epistle as an example of this, but just using this one as a primary example. Jesus says this to Sardis in Revelation 3.1. He says, These things you have said the seven spirits of God, said in the seven stars, I know your works, I know that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. But he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name in the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Obviously, we know Jesus is talking about a local church here in the book of Revelation. But if we cut this passage out and we put it in the Old Testament, What are the similarities, or what would we would think Jesus is talking about if this passage was in the Old Testament? Maybe it's just me, but I would think he's talking about a city, or or he's talking about a nation. Because it's the same message, right? Look, hey, I know who you are, I know what's going on. I need you to repent, or I will come to you like a thief, and I will end you. That's a very similar message we've seen from the Old Testament about nations and cities. And then as well, he says, but I know that there's a few of you that are still trying to do right, and I know you're still walking with me, and that's great, and I want you to continue to press on. He said the same thing about other nations. He would say, look, I know you're awful, you're wicked, you need to repent, but there's still a few of you that are trying your best. And he said, you guys, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to walk with you, and you're going to be okay. That's a message we see all through Jeremiah, that he keeps on telling that one righteous remnant, hey, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to preserve you, you just need to do what I do, do what I say. Right? Yet here in the New Testament, it's not directed to a nation. It's directed to a local church. Why do you think so many churches are so worried about the nation and they're pointing fingers at the nation and they're talking about how the nation is so wicked and how the nation needs to repent? I think maybe one of the reasons is because as long as they keep on pointing outside, they don't have to start pointing inside. And they don't have to start thinking, wait, do we need to repent? Are there things we need to do as a local body? Do we need to be worried that Jesus is going to end us because of the way that we've been behaving, the way we've been living? And as long as you can keep the focus on the nation, you get to stop putting the focus on the church. I think that's a problem. And I think all that anxiety and that confusion is because the New Testament keeps on saying, you need to be worried about your local church. You need to be worried about individuals. You need to be worried about yourself. And as long as we keep on worrying about the nation more than we're worried about ourselves, worried about our churches, we're in trouble and we have goals now that we can't even meet. Yet the New Testament focuses on individual souls and focuses on churches. Hopefully with this next point, we'll wrap everything else up. What should our focus be on? You know, what what should be keeping us up at night, if anything's keeping us up at night? We read the New Testament. Our focus has never been told to be on our nation, except for praying for our leaders, respecting our authorities. We we know about those things. God tells our focus should be about our own soul. And if I did a sermon called Living in a Sinful Nation, this is what should have been the focus, right? How are you going to survive living in a wicked nation? You need to be worried about yourself. Paul tells this to the Philippians. While he's leaving, knowing he's not going to be there anymore, he tells them, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Meaning you take responsibility for your salvation. Wake up and pay attention. Examine yourself. Make sure you're following Jesus the way he would have you to. Not only should I be concerned about my own soul, but I should be concerned about my neighbor's soul. And I think when people have this concept that we've got to get the nation to repent, this might be a very good motivation they have. And if it comes from this, I think their focus is on a New Testament attitude. But I'm going to be concerned about my own neighbor's soul, right? And I'm going to want to share the gospel with him. Not because I feel like the whole nation needs to repent. Not because I think we need to have this Israelite uh, revolution or whatever. 
that my concern is this person has a soul, they're important, I want them to go to heaven with me. And I want them to glorify God, right? However, let me throw this one in there. Sin does harm a community. It does. In Proverb, there's a great proverb for this concept that we've been talking about. And I think it's really the only Old Testament passage that we can clearly stamp on our society, our nation, our state, whatever you want to call it. Proverbs 14.34. I think this one does apply. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Right? I think that's still true. And the reason is, is because this isn't a promise to God, to the Israelites. This isn't some, you know, it's a clarifying about a personal sin. This isn't a prophet bringing this. This is Solomon just stating the truth. He's just saying, look, righteousness exalts a nation. It helps a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. You think about the people on your street. Maybe this is very selfish of me to say, but would you rather have the people living by you to be sinners or to be righteous? I would rather them to be righteous. And before I even go to what I really should be cared about, cared about their soul, cared about them glorify God, our lives are simply a little better because the people around us are righteous with good morals. You know, that there's nothing wrong with that, all right? But what I want my attitude to be is not maybe the selfish attitude of, I want you to be better morally so my life is better. But again, I want my attitude to be more like, I want to save your soul. Because all the morals of the world does not equal salvation, does it? All the righteousness of the world that we can attain with our own hands, we still don't receive salvation. It takes Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to do. I want to bring Jesus to my community. I should be concerned about shining the light of Christ. That's what my concern should be when we're on this topic. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives it light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When we use passages out of context, we lead to confusion. When we just try to follow Jesus the way that he's laid it out for us and he's wrote for us, the goals that he set before us, this isn't easy to do, but it is simple to understand. And when I had this goal before me, I just need to be the light of the world. I need to share Christ. I, I need to be able to use good works so that others might glorify God. When I had that goal, that goal's in my reach. I feel like I can do this. Now, get the whole entire United States to be righteous? Man, I can't do that. God could do that. I, I can't do that. That has to just be limited to my prayers that I give to God. But this, what Jesus told me to do, I can do this. I can shine my light before men for the goal here that they may glorify the Father in heaven. Right? When I have this goal, when I have the goals that Jesus gave me living in the New Testament age, that anxiety, that constant worry, that concern, it just melts away for me. And so to sum things up, come back to something really simple. If you do what Jesus told you to do, you're going to be okay. That's really the sermon right there. If you do Jesus, what Jesus told you to do, you're going to be okay. And let's always remember to pray for our country. Let's always remember to shine our light. But let's have that focus to glorify God and not necessarily to meet standards that, for promises that were never written to us. Hopefully this sermon has been helpful to you in some way. Of course, this morning was very emotional. Uh, it was very emotional for me. Uh, and I thank our sister so much for coming forward. Uh, and I told her, I said, you know what, we, don't, we can't get adults to come forward. Uh, and so I told her that from now on, when people complain about coming forward, she's going to get brought up as an example. Uh, I'm so thankful for that. If there's any way to shine your light, that's one way to do it. If there's sin in your life or you need to be baptized and you want to shine that light so brightly, especially for us that are in this room, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing?